So uh, please uh, welcome directly from California, Victoria Popic. Hello from San Francisco, everyone. I'm Victoria Popic. I'm very excited to be presenting at Rocket Moldova. Thank you so much for the invitation. Currently, I'm a fellow at Broad Institute, and I do research at the intersection of AI and healthcare. Today, I'm going to be presenting on various AI solutions that have been uh, recently created as a response to the COVID-19 pandemic. And specifically, I'm going to be focusing on healthcare solutions, talking about some exciting projects, as well as challenges we face when designing AI systems for healthcare, and specifically for COVID-19. So the big dream of AI is to create machines that are intelligent. We can move around the world, learn and perform all sorts of tasks, uh, kind of like a human. In the recent years, one field of AI that specifically took off uh, is called deep learning. And uh, deep learning focuses on uh, AI techniques that are especially inspired by the human brain. Uh, these uh, AI models are called uh, deep neural networks, and they're supposed to, at some high level, mimic the architecture of our brain. Uh, the special thing about neural networks is that uh, they can learn directly from the data, various examples and observations of the world, without being told any kind of set of specific rules or how to do the tasks that they're supposed to do. Uh, rather, they're just given examples and they are told whether they are right or wrong uh, in the task that they're performing. So this is extremely promising, of course, um, and um, has led to a lot of breakthroughs recently on AI performance across the board, we'll talk about in a bit. So first, let's take a look at uh, how this deep neural network is actually structured, since a lot of the works I'll be talking about today are using deep neural networks in general. So at the high level, a uh, neural network consists of a set of artificial neurons that are arranged in multiple layers. You can think of the network as a mathematical function that takes some input, performs various sets of transformations in each layer and produces some output. Each of the neurons in these uh, layers are interconnected and we actually associate a value with each connection called a weight or a parameter. You can think of these weights really as knobs and it is by tuning these knobs that the ne network actually learns. So it's typically given many, many, many examples and it's told whether it did the right thing or the wrong thing on each example. And then in response uh, to a, a wrong uh, uh, situation, it just goes and updates the, the weights. So let's look at a concrete example here. We have a neural network that is being trained to perform the task of uh, recognizing handwritten digits. This is a very classic machine learning task and the data set consisting of images of uh, handwritten digits from zero to nine. And we want uh, our network given an image to be able to recognize what digit it is. So uh, the output in this case is a value from zero to nine. And the input is this, in this case, and this example specifically is the set of pixels of the image. So if an image is 28 by 28, we'll have 784 pixels. And then given just this image, the network is supposed to learn various features and patterns about this image such that it's able to differentiate in, uh, between various digits. What makes a two a two? What makes a four a four? We're not uh, giving it any indication, but it's extracting these patterns on its own. And it does so in this hierarchical fashion. So from extracting initially some simple features, potentially in the early layers like virus edges, you know, detecting if there's an edge in a particular spot in the image, more complex features in the next layer, maybe detecting loops and so on. And then based on which neurons fire, which neurons detected what, it's uh, ultimately predicting what is the underlying digit. So as the network trains, uh, sees enough examples, we can then put it in practice and run it on, it on examples it might have not seen and hope that it does the right thing. 
So this is uh, one example of a neural network, but in the recent years, uh, as I said, the field really exploded. And so, so many various types of architectures have been proposed for the different uh, tasks and applications that we wanted to uh, apply AI to. So from computer vision to speech recognition, natural language processing, game playing, healthcare, sorts of fields. And uh, just focusing on healthcare, you know, recently you might have seen uh, in the news, there's a lot of buzz around the fact that uh, some of the AI systems out there were actually able to perform on par or even better than human doctors in certain tasks. So specifically for detecting cancer when formulated a computer vision problem, but there's a very exciting work out there that's showing that uh, cancer detection, breast cancer detection with mammograms or lung cancer detection in CT scans or skin detection from um, skin cancer detection from skin images is actually possible with AI, achieving uh, very good results. So, you know, is this it? Uh, have we actually solved uh, computer vision? Are the, these networks actually able to see the way that humans can? And the answer is, you know, not, uh, not so sure. Because as we talked about in the previous slide, what, uh, what these networks are doing is uh, looking for whatever patterns they see in the, in the images, um, such that it's a, uh, they're able to perform the task as well as they can. It doesn't mean that they're actually going to extract uh, the same patterns that the human might. So if it's trying to differentiate between a, a cat and a dog, uh, it might be looking at things like uh, some kind of texture or in certain parts of the image, some kind of pixels, whereas we might be looking at the uh, uh, presence of uh, ears or a puffy tail and so on. And so it's very important to keep this in mind so that we know we don't get uh, kind of surprising results when we realize that the, the network actually picked up something very different in the examples that we saw it from what we intended. And so here is an example of what I mean by that. Suppose we wanted to train an AI network to uh, discriminate between uh, whether something is skin cancer or not, given the pictures of moles. It happens to be that in practice, a lot of the images that are available out there have uh, all sorts of markings on, um, around moles that are actually cancer or rulers. And so if we weren't careful and uh, provided these types of images to the network, you know, we might find that it performs extremely well if we're testing it on um, similar images. Uh, so it's able to say something's cancer or not. But then as the researchers in this paper investigated, if given an image, say, with a mole that's not skin cancer but has markings on it, all of a sudden it doesn't perform so well. And uh, what this means really is that instead of picking up on features that differentiate the mole, which is what we are focusing on, it's actually picking up on these markings and thinking the marking is cancer or the ruler is cancer. So this demonstrates how important it is to make sure that the data sets that we use during training are general enough for the practical setting, especially in healthcare, training on some specific kind of data and then deploying it in a real world hospital without making sure that the data is representative enough can have uh, very severe consequences. So just uh, following up on this example, if we weren't careful and trained our network only say on pictures of uh, moles with light skin, our network most likely would not be able to perform well at all on darker skin images leading to ridiculous discrimination and bias in the system, which actually might be hard to detect. And this is a common problem of uh, many networks out there even deployed in production. So one example uh, is the Amazon recognition uh, system. It's a, fa a facial recognition technology, which was shown in several instances to be uh, gender and ra racially biased. So this is one example where MIT researchers demonstrated that on the task of identifying from an image, whether it's an image or of a man or a woman, the system performs much worse when given images of darker skinned women. In fact, it makes a mistake 30% of the time, whereas it's almost never wrong when given images of lighter skinned men. And so what this means is the researchers or the engineers that uh, designed and trained this system did not provide it actually an unbiased uh, set of examples to train it. He definitely underrepresented uh, 
darker skinned women in, 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 in the training data. So one conclusion is, you know, we need a lot of data, we need uh, unbiased data. But then we also have uh, other ex another situation. What if the data, even though it's biased, is, uh, is balanced, is inherently biased due to biases present in society? So this is one uh, example of uh, such a problem. It's another recent example from last year. So this article in Science published uh, um, discovered that an algorithm that's actually been deployed in a lot of hospitals uh, has uh, has very severe racial bias. So what this algorithm is supposed to do is it's supposed to predict whether a particular patient will need additional care. So it's assigning some risk score to a particular patient. And in order to do that, they rephrased, they reframed the problem of predicting a risk by looking at how much uh, money a particular patients spent on healthcare in the past. So they said, you know, the more money, the more likely some, something uh, serious happened. However, formulating the problem this way, they inherently biased the performance of the system because due to various factors in the society, social economic, uh, imbalanced access to healthcare across people who are uh, white and black, they've uh, actually trained the system to underreport the severity of the um, conditions in black patients. So in fact, uh, when the researchers actually corrected for this bias, they found that from uh, uh, the number of patients that actually got marked as high risk increased from 17.7 to 46.5% in the black population. And in fact, uh, looking um, at the patients that the system previously marked as very high risk, they found that it happened to be picking patients in some of the wealthiest neighborhoods uh, of the community where they were testing, uh, which means that a lot of these patients were spending Absorbent amount of money on healthcare, but it doesn't really did not really correlate with how serious the healthcare really was. So, again, another another example of how it is very crucial in order to avoid discrimination that can lead to severe consequences because we are talking about healthcare. Uh, we need to be careful about how we train the model. We need to be careful about analyzing and testing it very thoroughly. So this brings me to. Uh, AI solutions that have been proposed for COVID-19 and I'm going to go through various examples and as we do that uh, we're going to try to keep kind of the skeptical hat on for some of it because uh, it is extremely again important to understand these systems are being proposed are proposed to be used in a clinical setting and uh, when they're not thoroughly vetted severe consequences can arise. So let's look at uh, AI solutions for diagnostics, and what this means, uh, what this is, is solutions that are supposed to help doctors detect whether a patient has AI, uh, COVID-19 or not. So um, some of the doctors have found that there are actually visually uh, different markers on uh, scans, such as X-ray or CT, uh, in patients that have COVID-19. For example, the lungs have some. Uh, opacities or consolidations. And so this is kind of uh, promising since we know AI is doing really well in a lot of computer vision tasks. And we know that there are some markers specific to the disease. So theoretically, it seems like a good idea to try to develop systems that can uh, differentiate between um, an X-ray or a CT scan a bit, uh, that of a patient who has COVID-19 and who doesn't. And so lots of such systems have been developed over the last few months, especially in China, you see lots of reporting about uh, various uh, such softwares. For example, in this case, Wired reported about software from Infervision that got deployed into 34 hospitals. And then there's a table of a variety of other systems out there uh, that are also used in practice in China. Uh, there are also research papers being put on archive, many uh, such papers uh, describing uh, various systems uh, to perform that, AI systems. Here's one example looking at a um, network called CovNet, where the authors uh, designed a, a, deep, a deep learning network that is able to differentiate between scans, CT scans of people who have COVID-19, community acquired pneumonia or no pneumonia. And they reported really high numbers for sensitivity and specificity, which is the ability to 
detect how many people they can actually find who have COVID-19 to have COVID-19 and how many they find that don't have it, do not have it. Numbers are 90 and 96% respectively, very high. So, you know, is this uh, then a good idea? Should we all be using that? Uh, so, uh, based on what we discussed previously, one obvious question is, well, has this network been trained on a lot of data and data that is general enough to be applied across different hospitals and various different settings? Has the network actually picked up on uh, what differentiates COVID from other types of pneumonia? Um, has it been tested on various types of pneumonia that is not COVID? The answer is really unclear. In particular, there are some concerns about whether the network has actually picked up on differentiating viral versus bacterial pneumonia and uh, um, from the community and so on. But even if the network uh, is not suffering from bias and has been tested, a lot of uh, doctors have, doctors and researchers have kind of raised the alarm uh, about using this, uh, these systems and sort of ask the question um, whether this is really a right problem to solve uh, uh, for us at the moment. And the reasons for that is, firstly, this requires the use of CT scanners and CT scanners can act as vectors of infection. Secondly, there are definitely cases of patients who are positive for COVID-19 who don't have any markers on their CTs. So if we have people who, have, who are showing symptoms we, and we know that some of them won't show anything on the CT, what's the point of testing them on CT? And then uh, many doctors also said that uh, in certain patients uh, that do have COVID-19, the markers that they're observing are actually similar to uh, the markers of other pathogens or even uh, some markers that are present in people without any viral, uh, viral infections. So full sense of uh, security can arise for people who got tested negatively, uh, but may, may still have a disease. And then uh, kind of despair might arise in people who uh, got tested as positive, but they actually are suffering from some other virus. So it's uh, very important here to kind of, again, be skeptical and um, um, responsible about how we go about deploying such models due to all these sort of concerns that arose. Another kind of, uh, another type of detection that people have looked at is uh, instead of images to look at sound. So you see, you'll see online various uh, uh, websites, databases from different institutions trying to collect sounds of uh, COVID-19 cough or even voice. So people, and it's uh, theoretical again, it's conceivable that indeed there are some uh, specific uh, pattern in the sound of a person with COVID-19 coughing. Um, and so it, it, it is academically quite interesting to detect that. However, with these systems, again, we have to ask, how much data do they actually need to be able to differentiate and detect the specific pattern that makes a cough COVID-19 versus a cough just of any sick person? And we, we also know that the diversity of responses to COVID-19 across the population is very high. We have people with various uh, mild symptoms, no symptoms, very severe symptoms. So you'll imagine that just to get a good sample of all kinds of uh, um, coughs out there, you will need a lot, a lot, a lot of data. So um, even though some of these um, efforts are reporting uh, accuracy rates even as high as 70%, Again, important to be uh, sort of more conservative about deploying it in clinical settings at this point. So now let's move on to prognosis. This is a set of um, AI systems designed to predict what's gonna be the response of a particular person um, who has acquired COVID-19. How much care will they need? Are they going to have mild or severe symptoms? Are they going to need intensive care? So the main uh, idea is that if you could predict that, you could prioritize healthcare around this. And kind of a big alarm is sort of sounding in my head because we just talked about what kind of, all sorts of biases that uh, can arise when these uh, systems are not trained on a representative uh, set of situations. So if a person is marked as low risk, just like as an example we saw uh, before, they might not be given the health uh, care assistance that they need. Um, just because these networks uh, were biased against them. So I'm showing here one example of this risk calculator from i5 Analytics, but many such uh, 
calculators are out there. Uh, they're collecting data about pre-existing conditions from people. So in this case, they looked at 255 feature features of whether a person has a, a disease or doesn't, as well as some age features and trained the deep neural network to predict what is gonna be their response. So again, the community of doctors and researchers sounded the alarm and uh, in fact, even published uh, several papers like this one, where they showed that they, you know, they went through the literature and uh, uh, virus repositories looking for these uh, predictive models and analyzed them. Um, so here's a, a chart of um, various types of models that these researchers found. And uh, uh, they want to caution people kind of against using them because what they found is that these models indeed are not, uh, usually they're not even tested on COVID-19 data because it's not available yet. And they are at high risk of bias. They are overly optimistic about the, the sensitivity and specificity values that they're reporting. And so very important to be careful about this. And uh, as the scientists say, these systems could cause, cause more harm than benefit in guiding clinical decisions. Uh, okay, uh, next topic is uh, treatment. And uh, here we're going to start with uh, kind of a story about the new drug that got uh, um, discovered using AI. And this drug is baricitinib. Uh, so uh, recently, uh, not as recent, but in February, there's a paper that came out in the Lancet from Benevolent AI, which proposed this uh, drug baricitinib as a treatment for COVID-19. And typically this drug is used for rheumatoid arthritis. So how did the scientists go about discovering it? So they have access to this uh, beautiful, uh, it's called knowledge graph, which encodes sort, various sorts of relationships between proteins and genes and diseases and, and drugs. And so what, looking at such a graph, uh, Dr. Richardson of Benevolent, uh, Benevolent AI discovered that um, typically COVID-19 uh, coronaviruses enter the cells uh, in lungs, especially uh, called AT2 cells, via process of uh, receptor-mediated endocytosis, and they actually uh, most likely bind to protein receptors ACE2. So endocytosis, uh, this, uh, this process is actually uh, kind of controlled or promoted by a protein called AAK1. And actually we have various drugs that uh, target this protein and inhibit its activity, which could prevent um, the viral entry into the cell. So two of these drugs, sunitinib and erlotinib, are oncodrugs, and we know that they have very severe side effects. However, they saw that the drug baricitinib is also active with AAK1, but it's, uh, it has very mild side effects and uh, um, it can be taken in low doses. So, uh, and very excitedly, uh, they suggested this drug and the community, including the drug manufacturers and virus researchers that uh, are, um, kind of have looked at this, uh, this compound, got super excited. And the clinical trial is actually now underway, uh, looking at whether this drug is uh, effective or not against uh, COVID-19. So this is a very exciting story. Um, kind of the key question here is how did the benevolent AI uh, get this information um, and why did other people not um, not find this drug much faster? And what, uh, the answer is that they have um, built a system that scoured through many, many, many articles of scientific uh, research and uh, parsed these articles, which is some stru uh, structured text, into this um, knowledge graph that encoded these interesting relationships and uh, facilitated the discovery of unknown, previously unknown relationships. So this problem of parsing this uh, scientific literature and text is a very um, well-known studied problem. Lots of techniques have been proposed in the natural language processing community using AI and not using AI. And the task here, uh, there really is we, Kind of look through these uh, papers, which by the way, the numbers are growing exponentially, so it's totally not uh, feasible to manually curate these papers and do this uh, by hand, uh, is actually taking this kind of sentences like shown here and parsing it to detect what is the various entities that the center is talking about, like different proteins or genes, and what is the relation between these entities that it's reporting. 
And the latest state of the art to do this, kind of the, the model that's achieving the best performance on natural language processing task currently is called BERT and was um, uh, proposed by Google. And uh, the way it works is, uh, uh, so it's supposed to training this uh, model to perform a specific task. They classify something spam or not spam. It's actually trying to learn uh, the structure of the sentences. So it got trained on a large corpus of Wikipedia articles as well as books to actually figure out um, what the, how the sen uh, sentences are structured. And the way they did that is by masking some words in a sentence and having a network predict that. So now taking this uh, pre-trained uh, model, BERT model, you could then specialize it to a particular task, which is uh, what BioBERT did, for example, by training it in addition on scientific literature and training it on the task of now extracting various entities and their relationships, and they achieved uh, very great results. So this is an amazing application of AI, especially now when we're in a tight timeline and we have to go through all this uh, literature that potentially might hide somewhere some uh, very promising drugs uh, that can be repurposed for COVID-19 um, uh, and potentially be able to allow uh, uh, predict what also toxicity these drugs might have or affinities and so on. Uh, so that's uh, really exciting. But in addition to literature parsing and knowledge discovery, uh, AI has had a big history in drug discovery recently. One of the reasons is that uh, drug discovery currently uh, is very inefficient. So as this graph shows, which is uh, called Aram's law, uh, which is the opposite of Moore's law, uh, it's showing that uh, every nine years, the number of drugs uh, that the FDA approves per billion dollars is decreasing, halving uh, since 1950. And so in reality right now, to put a new drug on the market, it definitely costs over a billion dollars. And it's a really lengthy process. So here's a high level overview of the process uh, that, uh, that you have to go through, um, starting with the discovering the drug and then testing the drug in clinical trials. And um, for most of these of the drugs that go through this, many of them don't make it. So the failure rate is over 90%. Uh, so there's a big excitement about applying AI to various steps of this uh, pipeline. And in fact, there's over 200, 30 startups looking at this um, with the hope of streamlining this effort. So one of the um, uh, areas that AI can help is actually to figure out better candidates uh, for what uh, compounds uh, are going to be effective. So faster screening of le uh, identifying leads as well as optimizing the compounds and uh, looking at uh, targets. For example, it could predict what protein is better to target somehow but many other uh, opportunities are there. So I want to give a very brief example of how AI and deep, uh, deep learning has been uh, uh, already used and demonstrated is very effective in uh, antibiotic discovery. This is a project from MIT, which uh, trained a deep neural network on uh, various molecular compounds and uh, tried to identify compounds that are going to be effective uh, for uh, drug resistant um, bacteria. And then uh, the compounds that they identified, they actually tested them on mice. So they found, uh, for instance, a uh, new compound, an existing compound, but uh, uh, unknown to have antibiotic properties previously, halicin, uh, to be very effective against uh, several uh, bacterial infections. So this is super cool. Um, there is more work on drug discovery. So while the antibiotic uh, uh, project focused on uh, finding drugs, uh, there's also uh, an example of a project looking for what proteins to target, for example, by drugs. So this is a, an example specific to COVID-19 uh, coming from DeepMind, Google DeepMind, the AlphaFold algorithm that is able to very accurately predict, it's the state of the art now, the 3D protein structure given the genetic code. And why is this cool? Well, uh, it's definitely, we do have methodology to predict the 3D structure of proteins uh, experimentally. It's a lengthy process. And so uh, what AlphaFold has done, it has predicted various uh, SARS-CoV-2 proteins 
those, the ones for which we had experimental structures actually match them. And uh, it also will provide a sum for which we don't have the structure. So having the structure of the protein is uh, allowing us to actually pick uh, compounds that are uh, going to bind to this uh, or interact with this protein most effectively. So uh, this is also super cool. And finally, uh, the last kind of area I wanted to talk about is uh, patient care. So solutions for patient care, and specifically remote patient care. We know with COVID-19, healthcare workers are risking uh, their lives when they are treating patients that are infected. So one very promising approach is if, if whenever possible, uh, could we monitor patients that are sick remotely? And uh, this is a project uh, from MIT, super cool. They're using Wi-Fi signal to actually uh, monitor uh, monitor people, uh, they come, came up with this device that you just put somewhere in your house. It's able to see through walls uh, because this Wi-Fi signal actually passes walls but bounces off of bodies. So using deep learning, uh, they're um, detecting where the body is, what position, and then they're even able to detect things like heart rate, breathing rate, sleep state. Of course, if a person is, uh, has fallen and uh, they've recently applied it to a patient with COVID-19. Um, here's an example of the breathing rate that the system um, outputted for this patient. So super exciting. Yeah. Okay, so to summarize, there's been a lot of effort in trying to apply AI in, uh, to fight COVID. A lot of the solutions are particularly promising and exciting. Uh, for example, digging through scientific literature to find clues and drug discovery. However, there's definitely been too much hype about how helpful AI can actually be. Uh, a lot of unvetted methods are appearing online at an alarming rate, and these can actually do more harm uh, when it comes to human health and privacy and mental state. And uh, unfortunately, this means that uh, healthcare experts and doctors have to spend a lot of energy in trying to defeat these false claims, uh, which they really shouldn't have to do right now. And so, um, while everyone is trying to help definitely and do their best, I think it's important for us to be super cautious at this time, very responsible uh, with what we propose and put out there. Uh, but we can all do this together. Uh, so stay strong, Moldova. And uh, thanks uh, for inviting me again and for listening.